Welcome to the Music Is My Life podcast from Berkeley Online. I'm your host, Pat Healy, and take note of Huey Lewis. He, of course, of the news, who came to prominence in the 1980s with such ubiquitous mega hits as I Want a New Drug, The Power of Love, Hip to be Square, among so many others. But before that, he was living the life of a musical Forrest Gump, playing soccer with Ozzy Osbourne and the rest of Black Sabbath, going clothes shopping with Phil Linnett of Thin Lizzy, politely declining an offer to play on Elvis Costello's debut album. As a kid, his mom took in Billy Roberts as a boarder. That's the guy who wrote Hey Joe, and also who taught Huey how to play harmonica. Now, I've interviewed Huey a number of times over the years, and each time we speak, he reveals more incredible tales from his past. And he says that he himself always marveled at these stories. And that even inspired his song, Some of My Lies Are True. Wait a minute. It's true. Some of my lies are true. So with his backing band, The News, Huey has released 10 albums over the years, including Weather, which came out in 2020, and may unfortunately be the last from Huey Lewis and The News. Huey now suffers from a hearing disorder called Meniere's disease, which affects his inner ear and can trigger hearing loss and dizzy spells. He says he now has difficulty just hearing notes. So because of this condition, it was easiest for Huey to do this interview via Zoom, which means the sound quality isn't exactly 5.0 surround sound. But his stories are so compelling, they're worth an occasional digital glitch or two. I mean, the guy stowed away on an airplane to Europe as a teenager. He woke up one morning to find Dizzy Gillespie in his house. You'll also hear a reference or two to Berkeley songwriting professor Bonnie Hayes, who is going to incidentally be heading up Berkeley Online's upcoming songwriters master's program. We talk about Bonnie because her brother Chris was the guitarist for the news throughout the band's formative years. But before the 10 albums, before the fashion lessons from Thin Lizzy's leader, before where you going with that harmonica in your hand, there was his dad who hosted jam sessions in the local park and insisted Huey and his brother learn time. Let's let him tell you all about it. Well, my, my, my old man was a, was, a, was a doctor by profession, but his passion was music. And he was a drummer and a piano player. And I mean, he, we, had a, we had a set of drums set up in the living room, and he loved big band jazz. And he would just blast it, I mean, loud. And then he'd put us on the drums, me and my brother, and he you got to learn time. He would, he would tell us, you got to learn time, you know. Uh, so it started right there. And then when my parents split up, my dad got me... Um, guitar lessons, visitation rights, and guitar lessons was his way of, was his day. And we, I took guitar lessons from Rolf Kahn, who was a great Carter family style picker in, um, in Berkeley. And then I went, then, and he would convince me to go away to prep school. And then one thing led to another. Then I, in prep school, I picked up the harmonica, et cetera. Right. And, and can you still play uh, that kind of finger style picking? Barely. First position stuff. Well, when you write, do you um, what do you use as your main rhythm? Yeah, usually, I co-write with the boys, and they write. They bring a whole progression in, or something else, and then we'll just mess around with it. But most of the musical ideas start with really Chris and Johnny. Uh, although uh, you know, the, several songs I have the simpler stuff we've done, but uh, but it's a really a collaborative process with us. You know, it, it's we are as a band one songwriter. None of us is really an accomplished songwriter all on his own. And our best songs literally are contributed in all ways by all of us. We, we're a real band in that sense. you know. Speaking of Chris, uh, uh, I don't know if you're talking, which Chris you're talking about, but Chris Hayes. Uh, Bonnie's yeah. brother. Yep, that's right. <laughs> she says hello. Oh, uh, I love Bonnie Hayes. She's so terrific. And she's such, first of all, she's a great musician. and and But she's such a sweet person and so generous and so, you know, She's a, a, a talented. She loves it there too. Yep, she's uh, she's heading up. Uh, we've got a songwriting master's program. Good, yeah. that's great. There's no better. There's no yep. better. She's written a few killers. Yeah. Okay. So music was always in in the house, and your dad would have these jam sessions. And and I believe I heard you say once, like people like Dizzy Gillespie would show up. <laughs> that's a different story. Uh, Dizzy Gillespie showed up with my mother one night. 
one morning for breakfast. Okay. <laughs> that is a different story. This show just took a different turn. And my, my own man was a jazzer. And we, you know, and so my dad would run little jam sessions in, in a local park where everybody would bring, my mom would make spaghetti and they'd drink red wine again. And I mean, it just would jam. And the kids would just run around and screw around, you know, when we were young kids. So that's, that was kind of my, I looked at it, that looks like fun. The, the first thing that really hit me, though, was my old man took me to the Monterey Jazz Fest. And uh, Joe Turner and Count Basie, uh, I mean, sorry, Joe Williams and the Count Basie band did uh, All Right, OK, You Win, I'm In Love With You, right? And I remember the Basie band came out and played a song. They were just amazing. And we were like in the fourth row. And I must have been, shoot, I must have been 11, I guess, or something, you know, 11 or 12. And it was just amazing to look at that big band. And then Joe Williams came out and he was elegant and he said and his voice was so it was like butter man it was so good and he he said and i said to my man i would love to do that that's what i would love to do <laughs> so so that was the crystallizing moment there the monterey jazz fest first one i i didn't decide i was going to do it i just knew that was the first glimpse of wow that is cool and, and did you do pickup bands before clover yeah let's see now I go to school, right? I'm in school, and and uh, uh, my dad convinced me guitar lessons, and then convinced me to go to prep school. So now I go to prep school in New Jersey, and my mom had a boarder who was a guy called Billy Roberts who wrote "Hey Joe," and um, wow, my parents just put up, and, and he had he played harmonicas with one of these little braces, and he had a bunch of harmonicas, and he gave me a bunch of harmonicas. So I took him back to prep school and stuff, and I played a little bit in prep school and stuff. And I graduated from prep school at 16. I was a year young because I'd skipped second grade. And my my old man said, all right, you've you've done everything. I, he's the one who wanted me to go to prep school, and now you did, and you're great. And I'd, I'd been accepted to Cornell, and I was going to play baseball. He's like, only one more thing I want you to do. He said, what's this? Don't go to college. Not yet. I said, what? what? Dan, I'm gonna, no, no, no. Take a year off and bum around Europe. I said, really? He says, yeah. yeah. So he made me do it. And I took took my harmonicas, hitchhiked across the country. I actually stowed away on an airplane, which is a whole other story. Yeah, that is insane. I think I, I need to hear a little bit more about that. How on earth did you do that? There are no computers. The easy answer is there are, in those days, there were no computers. Everything was handwritten. Tickets were handwritten. There were no uh, security at all. Think airports are wide open in those days. We've yeah, it's a long time ago. This is sixty years ago. So, did, were, were you in a huge case, or did you just like sneak in with the baggage guys? Or well, what you did was in those days there were no computers. So, you, you, when you buy a ticket, it would go in a jacket, and a jacket would be written on cover of the jacket would be written your flight number and your seat number with a special silver pen, and and you write flight number, seat number, and then you go into the waiting area. And there would be a podium there. What you were supposed meant to do was you give the person, the, the the gal with your, uh, at the podium your ticket. She would open it up, the the folder, and tear the the deal out, and then put the fold. And then really, and then all you have is a receipt and the and the folder, and and go onto the airplane. Well, this guy taught me that if you if you can get into the enclave, which you can't, it's wide open. There's just a thing there. Early, first of all, you get your own folder. And you get your own special pen, which you can find in any one of the empty gates. All the all the drawers have all that stuff in them. And you write, take the folder, put LHR, which is London, and take the middle seat over the wing. I put that seat number on there. And now over in the corner, they won't pay any attention to. It. Pretty soon it gets filled up with a blah, blah, blah. And now all that these people have is this broken booklet. So now when you go on the airplane, they just look at your seat number like that. So now go on the airplane and take a different terrible seat. Not middle seat, another crappy middle seat, not your seat, in case you get caught and you say, Oh no, I'm I'm C C three, I'm up there. Oh, and, wow. and as long as the flight isn't full, boom. So this guy taught me this as I'm hitchhiking across the country. So I go to what was then Idlewild Airport, Kennedy Airport, and I hung out at TWA forever. For somebody else pretended that you could actually stow away with the, the mail post office was would fly and you could go with the cargo flight. But I tried that as that was a non-starter. So now I go back to 3WA and I hang out to the end. And I see the same ticket counter guy uh, the next night. And he looks at me, what are you doing? And I said, well, you know, I'm trying to get the thing. I don't have any money. I heard you can do bubble. But he says, 
wait till I get off at, at midnight and I'll show you. And, and when he got off at midnight, he gave me one of the envelopes wow. and, and wrote the silver pen thing on and said, go get him. Uh, and that's how I busked my way through Europe, played with some different collections and stuff. I actually had a big concert in Seville when I'd lost my passport and I'm playing in the streets trying to make 25 bucks so I can get my passport back because the, the embassy needed 25 bucks for a passport. Now um, these kids throw this big concert for Huey and Los Blues with a, a, a guitar player called Michael, uh, I think, I can't remember quite his last name. He's an Australian kid. You know, we did this little concert that went down a storm. And I thought, whoa, the bug had kind of bit for me. So then I thought, that's the second time I thought, like, you know what? Not only do I want to do this, I can. So then I went back to Cornell for sort of five minutes over a two-year period. But I joined <laughs> bands. I played with a, another guy called Ken Lifshitz. We did a little coffee house stuff. Then I joined a band called Slippery Elm. And we did sort of FM radio hits. <laughs> But meanwhile, San Francisco had exploded. This was 1969, maybe. And so I call, called my dad and said, I'm, you know, and I, I, went to, I went to class sort of five minutes over a two-year period. But, the, but the, this was a tumultuous time with the takeover, the SDS and the takeover of the, world, of the African-American Student Society and all that stuff. So you could take pass fail. You know, you didn't really have to do anything. And so I made it for two years. And then finally, it caught up with me. I called my old man. I said, Pops, I'm dropping out. You know, I'm, I'm, I'm going to be a musician. He went, whatever. You ever know what you're doing? You know what? I made that deal with you. Go ahead. That's what I did. Then I joined, came back to California, joined a big 10-piece bluegrass band. It was fun. We used to go busk in, in Fisherman's Wharf. We'd make a couple hundred bucks, really, some nights. But, of course, but there were 10 of us, you know. It was really fun. We had a big double bass. Sean played big double bass. And, and three of those guys were members of a group called Clover. And then Clover... Uh, recruited me and Sean, the double bass guy who also played keyboards in that band. That's how, that's when we started. Wow. You've been with Sean forever. I, I, I knew he was in Clover, but I didn't know he even predated that. Yeah. I, I can't even do the math. It's too complicated. So wait, I want to touch back quickly upon, so this guy who wrote, Hey Joe, what's his name again? Billy Roberts. Billy Roberts. Had he written that and then he was boarding at your mom's house? Like he had the hit and... Good. That, that was, you know, it was folk until, I mean, the Jefferson Airplane were a folk band. That right. Just kind of, that got electric, electric. So were the Dead, really. I mean, the Dead were kind of a bluegrassy band, kind of a... And then they, they got electric, you know, and... Uh, but he was a folk type. Dylan was the rage. That was that thing. And he had the... And he was, uh, he wrote quite a few songs and I think he'd written it by then. I don't, I don't know. But, and, and then I, I think he, it was a publishing problem or something, but he's, he is credited now with the song and he wrote it. Wow. That's amazing. And so, and you mentioned the dead and were they kind of in your social orbit at that point too? Yeah. The dead were amazing. I mean, you know, the dead were amazing. You know, they just threw everything. What they did, they were, they were these, they kind of, kind of took a jazz approach to rock music. That, I mean, they didn't know where they were going or how songs lasted forever. And man, I mean, they, there were some jams that were really, really fantastic back in the day. You know, we'd see, we go to Fillmore and see the dead sons of Chaplin and Moby Grape. Wow. Those are some good bands. Yeah. How many times do you reckon you saw the dead? Not, not I'm not a dead head because, right. but, but I've seen them at least 12 or 20. I sat in with him a couple times. When was that? Uh, in Oregon, first time. Let's see, at, at, in, uh, in Eugene. And they were really sweet. It's a kind of a funny story, actually. I, cause they asked me to play, to sit in. I was up there because, cause Ken Kesey had written a play and he wanted me to play a part in this play. It was just a kind of a theater kind of a thing. And I'm, I'm a huge Ken Kesey fan. He was coinciding with the Dead's concert and all that. He, and he wanted me to play Elvis Presley in his play, which is funny. I had a costume and all. It was, it was fun. And, and so, and I love Kesey He's, and Babs and the whole prankster thing, you know. So uh, I was up there and now, so the, the Dead said, hey, you want to sit in? I said, sure. I don't, and I can't remember if I had a harmonica or, 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 they, or they gave me one, but but now they said, here, and here's an amp, an amp and, and a microphone, and okay. And so, you know, huge. There's 50,000 people out there. So, yeah, no problem. So, and then they said, here, they put these in my ears, these two. I said, what's that? 
They said, oh, this is, these are your monitors. You're going to hear them. And I said, I am? What's that about? Okay, you know, so, and they had this thing where they had microphones where they could speak, they could sing in the microphone, and then they could also press a button, just talk in the microphone to everybody else without it going outside. So that's going on sometimes. So they put my ears, and I was not used to in ears anyway. And I crank the amp up or put the amp where I thought it would. And I start playing. I can't hear myself. I can hear everything else because they don't have enough harmonic in here. And the amp's feeding back, apparently. And now I begin to hear it, and it's going, oh, what's wrong? And as I go to fix it, I looked around, and Jerry has turned around. And we're playing the dun 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 you know uh, the stones thing and now uh jerry turns around and he the stage is out here and he's in back with his back turned working on my amp getting me getting me a sound and he spent the whole song getting me a sound it was so cool oh that's great jerry garcia was a very sweet guy and and super smart man super smart and he was really the spokesman for all of, of the whole generation. He he really could articulate what 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 was going on there. Into rampant intellectualism, he used to say, you know. Yeah, and y- you met him earlier too. Like where was he a family friend or No, no, I didn't. My my mother was is a big deadhead. My mother knew a lot of people. But I I you know, I went away to prep school. My mom was a hippie, one of the very first hippies, one of the very first deadheads and pals with all of them. And so and my dad thought it was, and I was only like twelve, and she thought it was. He thought it was it'd be a good idea if I got out of there. <laughs> you know, I saw very little of my mother, and, and I went to prep school for four years. Neither one of my parents ever has ever seen the place. But we reconnected, my mother, of course. My, you know, but in those days, she was, and she was living in the in the, in the counterculture. You know, with all that, she was the biggest deadhead that ever lived. My mom. So when you started playing. With, in Clover, though, I'd imagine like that kind of she she was probably a huge fan of that band, right? She was a fan of mine, you know. Yeah. She was mother after all, so she and she'd wear always stuff either tie dyed. She made tie dyed Huey Lewis stuff, and you know all that. She was a, just totally supportive, big fan. You know, she was funny. It's funny too because the music uh, that you did with the news isn't necessarily something that lends itself to the hippie expression <laughs> but and, and that's a very really good point you're hitting on something very interesting there because it's not just music music's in, in, involved but it, that's music is one part of this pie it's really a connection and in, in kids and it means different things to different people at different ages for kids it's a it's a way to say hey i'm a i'm a fish person or i'm a i'm a whoever i am you know it's a it's an identity and then, and then for older folks, it's it's somebody they want to you know relate who speaks their language. Who's it's how you relate to them and who the other audience members are. Because with the dead, there's there's people in those audiences. I've been to more shows than Jerry Garcia. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I mean seriously, there's relationships there that are as long as as that. Now that Jerry's been gone for whatever it is, you know, it's it's that way. So, I mean, some people I remember. Um, Bill Walton's wife told me, oh, do you know the Grateful Dead? Because we were watching a basketball game. I said, yeah, I know him a little bit. Probably we're the same neighborhood and everything. She says, oh, you know, Bill's just a huge fan. I said, yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, a lot of people are fans. She, she says, yeah. You know, she says, I don't really care for their music, but they're really great people, she said. And they're fans. Cool. So, you know, that was that's all part of the whole thing. It's a and, and and that's what pop music is, you know. I mean, it's communication with an idea. It's not, it's, you know, that's why being too precious with it is kind of crazy, you know. It's it's for, for what we do. I mean, jazz, music is music, you know, and there are serious musicians. But this is, this is folk music, what we're doing. Yeah, tell me about that in regards to Clover and then with the news. When you had joined Clover, you joined something that pre-existed. But then when you went and started the news or the American Express, it seems like you had a pretty clear-cut vision from the get-go of what you wanted Huey Lewis and the News to be. Yeah. I mean, it was kind of guitar relief, you know, for me. I liked, uh, and, and that's why Johnny and I were the first two guys starting. And I said, saxophone and harmonica, you know, let's, let's do that. Let's you know, let's go that way as opposed to you know that kind of stuff. So, um, 
Uh, but Cl- Clover, Sean and I ruined Clover. Clover was a, was a really good uh, country rock band. No, honestly. And Sean and I joined that band, and we were we were on like a James Brown kick for some reason. We were listening to KDIA over there in Oakland, and and James Brown was having hit after hit after hit. We knew every word. Forget the, the music was you know it was just a groove one funking for fun on the one you know boom and and but we knew every nuance of those songs so we put that we added that element to the thing and really confused the situation it was that we were we were too difficult to digest originally and when with us in the lineup it was just chaos and so you know we tried for a couple of years and it, it, i think we ruined that band I, I like that interpretation but then also I, i've heard you say that um kind of that punk rock kind of blew your chances too. Like that you guys landed in London on pretty much the day that punk rock became a huge thing. Our timing wasn't great, but I I love the punks. They weren't conforming to anything that the record companies were telling they should be. They were just saying, Hey, we don't care. I'm going to sing my own songs, my own way. I'm not very good, but I don't care. And I thought, wow, what a relief. Instead of trying to make yourself uh, attractive to a record label, just thumb your nose at it, which interestingly is what the dead did in the, in the very beginning and all that, you know? So, and that was the, that was the switch that hit, you know, for me, I just went back to Marin County when Clover broke up and surrounded myself with these, my favorite players. And we just, we did it for fun. It was all for fun. We had a Monday night live thing and it was just a kick. There was no, question about well we're going to do this or do a demo or any of that junk and it just started to take off it was very organic and if i could backtrack a little bit um i I think uh i I remember you saying something about uh phil linott uh was being very influential and and helping you kind of find your uh find your you know we talk about expressing ourselves through things other than music He, he, he i think he said he taught you how to dress yeah, you know, he dressed me out of his closet. <laughs> That's hilarious. Put this on. No, no, you, you need a scarf here. Here, try. No, no, no put it like this. And he, he, he dress. And we, we'd go to King's Road to shop, to shop for clothes and stuff. And he'd buy stuff for me and dress me up as as if I was part of his band, you know. But I learned so much from Philip. I mean, I learned everything about how to be a star, how to treat people, your fans, how to treat band members how to treat crew members, how to treat journalists, radio people. Philip was an, un, he loved being a star. He, he just loved it. And, and and it's one of those things where it can really be obnoxious, you know, when people are coming at you all the time. And you have to know that there's a way to around that, which is talk to them and say, hey, I cannot sign all your autographs. Thank you very much. Appreciate it. You know, our new records coming out, whatever, bubble up here, you know, take a picture, see ya. But Philip was just brilliant. He was so brilliant. I miss him all. I still miss him. He was, he was my mentor and, I'm, and, 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 and nobody could touch him on stage. Best hard rock band I ever saw. So was that, that whole kind of, um, you know, he took you under his wing basically in the waning days of Clover then, right? During Clover, Clover supported Thin Lizzy's tour. Mm-hmm. And the very first night, we our very first show was in Oxford, and the curtain was down. It's a it's a small little pl- it's a small place. They were playing not small, but you know the, those theaters with three thousand whatever they are. And so, uh, <laughs> it's a funny story, man. Because now, uh, and we, this is our first show with Thin Lizzy. We got tw- we got twenty five dates booked, and we're told, hey, don't expect the sound check, you know, until until the tour gets going and. And furthermore, you know, it's going to be tough because they're all Lizzie fans. And we're billed, by the way, as support. Okay, so first first show, the curtain is down. They just got off the stage. And we're struggling to get set up, get our amps working and everything. Okay, we're, we're, we think we're kind of okay, you know. And then the curtain's down. We've got nobody to introduce us. And while the curtain's down, we're hearing suddenly uh, we're taking a little too long maybe or whatever. Not, not very long, but a little bit. <sighs> Let's see. Right. <laughs> and our road manager, I mean Frank Martinet comes out and goes, and he's never introduced the band or anything. He's just a road manager, but we didn't have anybody here. Frank. So Frank goes and goes, uh, how's it going? 
<laughs> he goes, well, thin Lizzie will be right out. He says, and they go, Why? He says, but first, here's Clover. <laughs> oh, no. <laughs> and, and they go, boo. And we started playing. And it was all we could do to get through, I don't know how many songs, you know, like a 35-minute set. When we finished, it was just brutal. I walk off and stand in the wings of the stage with Philip. And he'd watch the whole thing. And he goes, can I have a word with you? I said, sure. Come on. Come to my dressing room. Let me give you a few tips. And he just took, had started right in on me and said, you know, which songs, this, and bum. And he was just fantastic. That's amazing, though, that he singled you out because you weren't even necessarily the head guy. He liked the harmonica. He wanted me to play harmonica with him and stuff. I, I don't know why he, he I don't know. That's I don't great. Know why he me out. I like that because it's like he just saw something in you. He's like, uh, well, there's like some story about uh, the guys from the Clash watching Joe Strummer play for the first time and be like, he's got the wrong suit on, but he's got the right idea. Yeah, no, no, right. right, right. I, I think there was some of that actually. Because then, you know, I played on his solo records and stuff. And, you know, we had a wonderful relationship. In fact, I, I, I was producing some stuff on him when he passed away, you know, and, and Chris played on that stuff. And we, we cut it with a band and we had his managers asked me would i do it i said he's got to be healthy and and they said he is i said okay fine and he was and he flew over and he was great he was charming you know he could nobody could be charming like philip and uh, we spent a week and he had he had been lazy for a long time not sung up in his range and and sung lower in his range and i wanted to, i'd written uh, written place these songs one of them which was a cover to but we placed them kind of up a little bit more, you know, in higher range. And he struggled with that because he hadn't sung up there for a while. So we didn't get any real vocals yet. We got, we got some rough vocals that, that show the song, but, the, but they weren't, they weren't master vocals by a long shot. And he had his visa came up seven days. So he was going to come back and he went back and passed away. Ah, that's tragic. And, and did, did you know him to be like, I mean, if you, if you said he's got to be healthy, you, you obviously knew he had struggles. He had a problem. He, he, li- he loved to, you know, have fun, man. Philip would take anything. <laughs> he, but he was, he was indomitable for a long time. You know, he was stronger than any of that stuff. But then he wasn't. Yeah. So when you're doing this thing, you know, Clover's opening up in Lizzie is... It, place for me just a little bit when the elvis costello thing happens we're clover's <laughs> opening for thin lizzy and we make a we make our record we recorded rockfield in wales which was really cool man a way out in, in a funky studio where dave edmonds did all this stuff and and um and in the next studio was uh, was uh black sabbath with ozzy and, and we played soccer and stuff we had fun but um jake and dave jake Riviera and dave robinson went partners on clover Dave was already managing Graham Parker in the rumor. And, and so they went partners on us and Jake was managing Nick Lowe and they went partners on us and they said, let's form a management company. And then they had the idea to phone stiff records and then they found Elvis. So they, they said, we need a band for, to make the record. So they used Clover's rhythm section, Mickey Shine, John Chambody, Sean Hopper, and John McPhee who played wonderfully on that record. And uh, they cut that record in two weeks at Pathway Studios. Nicolo produced it and they just little play, they played it and just the dials on and then just put it out. It was, and it's brilliant. Mm. It's unbelievably brilliant. Elvis was sweet as pie. He asked me if I wanted to play on a couple songs, but we had been torn like crazy because our, our record contract was 10,000 pounds. We had two weeks off and I had my girlfriend over. So I said, Hey, if I'm only going to play in a couple of songs, I'm going to go tour around Europe. So, and Elvis happened out of that, out of our same management thing with Jake and Nick Lowe and the Damned and all that. And I watched all those punks and, or, you know, and Elvis not a punk, but you know, and it was just a wonderful formative time for something great to see. You learn, you know, I learned all my chops. That's where I, that's where they started. So you go back to Marin County and you form Huey Lewis in the News, or like I said, the American Express. Yes, we're playing Monday Night Live, and then Nick Lowe calls me. And says, I, I think I just stole a, I stole one of your lines. I wrote a song, and I think you, you, you I owe you. And he told me thing. I said, ah, whatever. It's, yeah, I don't care. You don't get even. And then it, I said, he said, no, I really wanted. I want to make a. I said, tell it. Give me a round trip ticket to London. You know that that's fine. You know that round trip ticket. How about if you use it, 
and come play on my record while you're over here? I said, sure. So they flew me to London. Meanwhile, backstep one more time with our little Monday Night Live band that we weren't calling Huey Lewis and American Express yet. We're just calling the Monday Night Live band. Our local studio owner tried to get in to, to our, our shows begin selling out in these small little clubs, but just selling out, there'd be lines around the block and stuff. And so this gal offered us free studio time. Uh, Patty Gleason, Pat Gleason, the great synthesizer guy, played with Miles and all that stuff. And they gave us a um, some free studio time. And for a laugh, we cut a disco version of Exodus that we called Exodisco. I have heard this. <laughs> okay. And so I had that as a tape, as a little cassette. So now... Nicola, I said, sure, Nicolo. So I fly to London. I go straight to the studio. We cut Born Fighter, one of his songs with Nicolo. I play harmonica on. And then Edmonds cuts Bad is Bad. Nick had told me he wanted to cut Bad is Bad. I said, sure. So Edmonds cuts Bad is Bad with Rock Pile, with Terry Williams on drums and live and harmonica. It was fun, so much fun. We cut those two things. And then the record company comes down to hear the songs and stuff. And Oh, they love everything and they're great. And then there's like kind of an uncomfortable silence. I said, you guys want to hear something funny? I said, yeah. So I put the extra disco on, right? <laughs> and the record company goes, wow, that's pretty cool. I mean, that could be a hit. And I said, really? He says, you want to make a deal for that? I said, sure. He says, okay, come see me tomorrow. And, and, and he leaves. So I say to, I say to Jake, Jake Riviera, who's there, you know, I said, what do I do, Jake? He says, here's what you do. Yes. Get three thousand pounds and tell them you want uh, uh, and and then if they want they're going to want you to amend it somehow I guarantee you and when he says tell them you'll do it but they have to pay for the studio time and and you want the three thousand pounds right now and so that's what I did I went in there and bingo I got a check for three thousand pounds and and sold extra disco now I go back to the studio and I first of all I called boys up you know and the Monday night live and I say guys guess what? We got a singles deal for the Monday Night Live band, you know? So now I go back to the studio because they wanted me to sing a little more on it. So they wanted me to sing a little more. I said, no problem. Just, you got to pay for the studio time and give me the check. So I, I go down there. So I go back to the studio to get the master. This is analog now, right? There's, you know, two inch tape. And because it was a demo that we'd done, they have no tone reel. They did, they aligned the machine with this, this tape. And then they, then we cut the song on the end of the tape. So now when they go to align the machine, they by accident go too far and erase the song, erase 15 seconds or 30 seconds of the song. And I go, tragedy. I say, oh my God, what have you, you know, but they say, we're so, 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 I said, I just made a deal for this thing. They say, well, we don't. I said, I'm going to have to re-record it. I'm going to need five days studio time. I got to sing. They go, okay, we'll do it. We'll give you five days. So I took the, master quarter inch and put it onto two tracks of the multi-track and then i sang on another track mixed it down again to a quarter inch and that figured that was the master i know i lost a generation but i knew that it wasn't going to be a hit you know and then with the rest of the time we cut three other songs one of which was given it for love uh, from philip Lennon, and those three songs got us our manager and our record deal for the most part that's amazing. Did you know right from the get go that you didn't want to have anything to do with this exodisco? No, I, I mean I knew it was a it was a novelty thing. Yeah, I mean, should I should I, should we try to re, re spend a re record it and all that? Yeah, you know, I mean, I knew it wasn't the future. You know, right? I was starting to think. Wait a minute, we can really make a band here. And, and I'd been kind of thinking it for a while since Clover broke up. I had something to, had to do something. And I played with the different, different cats around town. I played with Gravenitis for a long time. And I played with uh, some different cats around town. And, and, but I really wanted to do my own thing, kind of like I, I wanted to sing, but I never got to sing much. How did you find that chemistry with Johnny and Chris and, and the rest of the guys to really form something? Well, I, I, I'd always admired Johnny's, Johnny and Bill. And, and so that was a no brainer. And Sean, I knew from working with Sean was wonderful and got a big ears, you know? And then, so the only two missing pieces were, were, were Mario and Chris and Mario came along cause he was in, in the same band with Johnny, Bill and Mario were in the, were in Clover's rival band. So I, I said, what about Mario? They were a little reluctant, but we, we, we got Mario in the band. And then I met Chris at a, at a friend's house. And Chris, you know, Chris is in retrospect, 
really the key was the final piece of the puzzle. But what a huge piece of, the, of our puzzle Chris Hayes was, you know, because he and it was funny because he was like, when I first saw him, my friends, he was he looked like he was 11 years old you know? <laughs> <laughs> Just, and, and diminutive. And then so I, I, I said, my friend, he said, what are you doing? I said, well, I'm getting a band together. I need a guitar player. I said, I'm just, all I need is a guitar player. And he goes, what about Chris right here? I said, oh, Chris? Yeah, Chris says, Huey Lewis, how you doing? You play guitar? Yeah. I said, no kidding. You want to you come up and jam? He says, sure. So the next day, Hayes comes up, and he's got his little hollow body guitar up here. He's a jazzer. You know, he's got his guitar like this. So, so, uh, but he could, you know, he, he could play, man. You know, wow, could he play? And so <laughs> uh, over the course of the time, you know, we got him to lower the guitar one, one notch at a time. And then we he got in some guitars. And, and then we, we started, Chris and I wrote together, you know, and we wrote some, we wrote some good stuff, you know. And John and Johnny is the same way. I mean, Johnny and I have the same sensibility because we grew up in the same place. He plays horn. I play harmonica. I'd always admired him and knew we had the same sensibility. And interestingly, we have a really good blend. Him and the, our, our voices are interesting. You know, I'm a baritone. He's a tenor, probably. I mean, he, he sounds like a, a higher version of me, you know, in a way. The more we've worked together, the more we begin to sound like each other. <laughs> you know, it's, it's, it sounds kind of creepy. I mean, uh, you know, when you, you you put up vocal tracks by themselves, and you go, wow. We, we, we begin to pronounce the same words the same way, you know, where, where maybe we didn't one time, you know. So, so Johnny Cola and the News is going to be the next iteration, right? <laughs> it, if if I can't sing, it sure would be nice to have somebody do the songbook. You know, I mean, you know, since we we lost Mario and now we lost Chris. Chris retired about uh, oh shoot, almost ten years ago. So we work with uh, a, a couple of guitar players. One guy, our bass player, is a guy called John Pierce, who we got from L.A. He was a session guy, but we knew him because he would made some records above and uh, uh, in. Northern California, we met him. And I mean, he was, he's just brilliant and, and fun. And, and, you know, the thing about being in a, in a band is it's the other 22 hours that are so difficult. The, our music's not that hard, you know, you can figure it out, but you got to be there and want to be better all the time at the same song, playing the same song every night, trying to get better at it. You know, it's not for everybody. It really isn't touring and all, but John is brilliant. And then we got better then. And then, um, uh, we have two guitar players, Steph, Steph Burns and uh, James Hera, and each both both are brilliant. We have to use two because they're, we're, we're their second gig kind of thing. Right, they're both, they're both brilliant. But with the fun part is to when you're singing the songs or you're listening even how the songs the material take on a little different hue with a different instrument with a different musician. It, the, how it rolls that way, and it's, it's fresh, it sounds fresh again. It's kind of all you need, you know. Nice. And, and so have you been able to do some rehearsal here and then with the guys? I tried. Yeah. My hearing got pretty good. And when I tried, I would call to rehearsal. And then, of course, my hearing crashed three days before mm. rehearsal. And when I tried, I couldn't, I couldn't hear anything. Damn. I tried that one more time. And the same thing happened. But I th I'm on a pretty good run right now. <laughs> and I'm, you know, I'm hoping. I don't know. Right. I have to be realistic, you know. I, have, I probably have to be realistic. I mean, it's a long shot mm -hmm. that I'll be able to fire up with the band and play a big venue. I mean, the PA says, levels the devil with what I got. If it's loud, it's really yeah. goes yeah. for me, you know. So we'll see. But uh, I mean, but it's important to remember that there are people worse off than me. I mean, yeah. The, the, yeah, I think really the worst. The worst part about it is, you know, initially in the first couple of years, I felt so bad for letting the boys down. Right? You know, I mean, I'm not that great a singer. But I've I was always been reliable, you know. I really mm -hmm. cancel very few gigs. I got a voice like a Mack truck, you know. And but now, so now I'm not suddenly not reliable. So I felt terrible about the not just the guys in the band, but the crew. You know, these guys we've been together for almost forty years, all of us. You know, so it's just that that thing was terrible. The fans. I feel bad about and now it's three years down the road and all the crew's okay everybody's sort of okay in the family but you know i can't even enjoy music I'm, I'm a jazz buff you know and i play jazz and and cook and that's my it's the happiest i ever get you know and now i can't play I, just music's not part of my life it's terrible that is devastating but but i'm sure 
then with the human condition that you do gravitate towards something else, right? Like to fulfill that void. Well, we have a Broadway show, a musical that we're trying to get to, to Broadway, which is really good, I think. What you do is you stay, you stay busy and you stay creative, you know, and you need, you need stuff to look forward to. That's what I do. I like, I, so I have several irons in the fire at the moment. I got, it's called the heart of rock and roll. It's not about Huey Lewis in the news. It's, it's a original story set to the music of Huey Lewis news, uh, a la Mia, Ma, uh, Mama Mia model, not the uh, Jersey boys model. It's not about us, but it used our music. And, um, we put it up in San Diego for six weeks, got great reviews and, sold out standing ovations every night. Uh, we were about to get a theater in Bro- on Broadway uh, and fortunately did not, or the COVID thing went and wiped us out. And so we're waiting and that will be a really fun and gratifying thing if when and if that happens. And again, the, the exciting thing about that is all, all the songs are Huey Lewis and the News songs, which means they're not all written by Huey Lewis and the News. Maybe Two thirds of them are are written by us, and they're all handled completely differently. Musical director is a guy called U, uh, Brian Usfer, and he's brilliant. And he did um, well lots of shows. He did Kinky Boots, I think. He did Frozen, and but he's just he's brilliant, and he handles the songs and gives them all completely different settings than ours. He he zigs when we zag, and, and just did that so wonderfully. First of all, it's refreshing to hear all these different changes. These songs handled in a different way and and next of all when you hear the body of work done that way when not by all these different singers and stuff you realize you know there's a thread that runs through there and it's really weird and i mean admittedly that's you know my lyric sort of but it's more than that it's it's and the other and the songs that we that are outside songs that we cut are in the fold and it's interesting so there's a personality there that a band of personality that we that we have that don't even we don't even know about you know yeah i imagine that's exciting to see because it's almost like seeing your work done that way present presents something you wouldn't have been able to see just continuing to do what you were doing playing those songs if you hadn't done this exactly and some of them are completely rearranged some of them are sung by women some of them are boom and it's really cool i've been working pretty hard because we had to we had changed lyrics minimally, you know what I'm saying? So I, they had to make me a producer because I, I had to look after, after the music. I did, you know, I didn't want to, I didn't want to be a joke. Having said that, I got into, I, because I'm a producer, you know, they got to listen to me on, on every front. And so it's really been a wonderful creative experience. I mean, you know, and we've been working on it for years and years, but I think it's really good and it's, it's pretty exciting. Give, give me a quick sample lyric change. Uh, lyric change. Okay, let's see. Um, well, here comes this guy. Whoa, yeah. Uh, 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 a feeling I can't deny. A feeling I can't deny, maybe? I don't know. She sings it all from a woman's point of view. I sang it. Hit me like a hammer. I mean, they're all, you know, they're, they're different. And little stuff. Uh, if this is it, at the very end, I had to change a couple things. We wrote a new song, Johnny and I and Brian used for the news director called I want to be someone that's the centerpiece of the whole piece. And that's really centered around the, the character, you know, so, and, you know, and we got some television, I got a, a TV show we're developing uh, and this is not very far along yet, but this is, uh, but it's very exciting because the guy, the producer involved is a big, is a big deal. And he, I, I won't even tout it, but it, it's the idea is that it's a romantic comedy where, where episodes are based on one of our songs. I remember when we spoke before, you were talking about how you were in such a perfect per- position to achieve the success that you did because you were at an age where you'd seen it before with other people and you knew what to expect. And I, I think you even took the guys aside and said, this only happens once, the rise to fame. Let's let's do it right. Enjoy it. Enjoy it. Yeah. No, that's exactly right. I mean, because I've been around Philip and f- I'd watched Philip. Philip taught me everything about how to deal with fame, fans, band, all that stuff. All you do is just watch Philip. I mean, he was brilliant. And I knew how fleeting it could be because I'd watched Philip's career. I watched Nick Lowe, who's, I mean, the most English of artists and the most English of people. He's so, and he's a brilliant artist, not, not be appreciated in his home country. 
That is insane. You know, so, I mean, I know how this thing, that, 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 that fame thing is to, you know, it's, you need to enjoy it. Although if you make it your life, then you're dead. Then you, then you don't have a life. A lot of these guys, I mean, I feel sorry for the Michael Jacksons and the princes of the world. I'm, I'm better off. I'm still alive. I got a life. Life is a good thing to have when your career doesn't go so well. <laughs> you know, so the, that ride was a particularly rocket ship ride because of the MTV thing. And what's interesting is, you know, radio was king. You talk about big hits. There never was a bigger hit than a 1983 number one hit. That's about as big as it got for a lot of reasons. First of all, brief history backing up, Top 40 Radio was created with the advent of push-button radio because they the programmer opined that if as long as people didn't hear something they didn't want to hear, they wouldn't push the button. But if they, they heard something they didn't like, they could push a button and change the channel. They didn't have to search for it. So the idea was narrow your playlist top 40 and then fm radio started as an alternative to that it was stereo but nobody had stereo in their cars and so and, and they played anything they wanted it was kmpx kscn big daddy down donahue all that stuff but even by the mid 70s early to mid 70s fm radio which is now the the major radio in all the cars and everything else ams just talk radio is programmed and by 78 79 80 81 82 the Dominant format is CHR, Contemporary Hit Radio, which is top 40, except that it's about top 28. They're, um, they're playing the same. And if you're one, two, three, or four, you're getting 10 plays a day. So it doesn't get any more pervasive than that. Then MTV comes along, and MTV plays their videos, their playlist exactly mirrors radio's playlist. The number one there is number one there for, for many years. And so those hits... When you had a hit like that, you know, everybody heard it and everybody saw it. I mean, it, it was a big, big deal. So it, it kind of, and we felt MTV, you know, if you remember cable was new, you know, it, it, even before MTV came because of cable and we would feel it. I'm in San Francisco. There's no MTV. We got a first record out. Uh, we do a video or something. Blah, blah, blah. And now suddenly from Tulsa, Oklahoma, I get a hundred fan letters. Just because they they had cable, <laughs> it was amazing, and then you could feel the different parts of the country opening up to with, with MTV and stuff. Yeah, so it really was a rocket ship ride in that sense. You know, there were times there where I was in a, I had a driver. You know, we do put do the Elvis route or the get out of the airports. And you didn't want to go to a McDonald's and you didn't want to go to a, any malls. <laughs> you know, and now now I go to a mall. I don't even get recognized. Well, but it seems like you you knew that from the get go that being in point A would eventually be in point B, and you were able to handle it. Or, or did did it work on your nerves at all? Exactly right. I mean that that's it. And, and I, so I, and I have other interests. I like the outdoors a lot, you know. So I have stuff that I go to. I have a life, <laughs> you know. And that helps. <laughs> Sometimes it helps to have a life. You talk a lot about uh, how having a number one hit in 83 was just huge, pervasive everywhere. And what I find interesting about the pop landscape around that time is that there were just so many different types of music that were on the top 40. Like pop was just this huge stew of tons of different stuff. And by the way, that's a part of that chr thing that i miss very much one it was an editing process if you want to hear a huey lewis and news tune on top on chr radio you could hear a garth brooks song a commodore's tune uh you know a madonna tune a whitney tune uh you know and, and it's all over the map reo speedwagon alabama you know it's all over the map michael jackson this is this is a typical radio and records is uh you know playlist and nowadays, of course, it's so fragmented. Nobody, you, you just can't have a hit like that. No, nobody can get everybody's attention. But I think it was good because it would educate us. It, would, it was it was a good editing process, really. I, I've never apologized for, for pop music. This is, as I said before, this is folk music. You know, this it's popular music. So that's that's what we're about. We're not virtuosos here. That's we leave that to the jazzers and the classical people. <laughs> yeah. Well, when when you did have sports and, and it did have so many hits. Did you know 
when you were writing that record that I always wonder that about, you know, it feels like the record company knows it's going to be hit. Do the artists know it's going to be hit also? Like, did you know you were working with something special, a special group of songs that was going to do something? I wish I could say I did, but I, I don't. <laughs> I, mean, I knew when, when uh, Harder Rock and Roll hit. Was that our second single? I think Harder Rock and Roll was the second single. Heart and Souls, the song, was the first single off our sports album. And that was the song we needed to be a hit. And it's an outside song. It's written by Mike Chapman and Nicky Chin. You don't miss. They, they played, they, they've written a bunch of hits. And, and when I heard the demo, I said, that sounds like a hit. You know, so we just, we just copied the demo. You know, I sang it, so it sounded differently that way. But basically, instrumentally, we just copied the demo. And it was a hit. And then the next song they released was Harder Rock and Roll. And, and that thing went as a hit. I went, if Harder Rock and Roll was a hit, we got a lot of hits because harder run roll is not meant to be. It's not, it's, it's like an album track. You know, it's not a, it's not a hit record kind of thing. You're not, not going to, you're not going to get married to harder rock and roll. <laughs> <laughs> you know, it's, not, it's just not a hit, but it was a hit. It went, went top 10 as boom. And then came one a new drug. And then, you know, if this is it and like that, how did you keep the band together all all that time as far as uh you know that was such a long stretch with all the same guys and, and you mentioned chris retired just a few years ago and mario but they were everyone was in it for a long long time well we pay well yeah <laughs> it's it's a fortunate thing that our relationship works bands are funny and you you correctly articulated it's, it's not failure it's not the lack of success that breaks bands up. It's success that breaks them up. Because, you know, as long as you're striving and you're going, trying to make it, we're all in this together. Now we start to make it, oh, let's see. But fortunately in our band, nobody, you know, really aspires to a different position in their band. You know, they're happy, to, you know, Billy doesn't care if you do it, if I do all the interviews, you know, or nobody cares if I do the interview. That kind of thing. It would just kind of work. And, 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 you know, we handle it professionally as well. We're not, people say, well, are you still friends? Well, you know, that's a silly question. We're closer than you are with the brothers, really. I mean, you spend that much time together on a bus, forget about it. You don't spend that much time with your brother. So the fact that we don't talk every day on the phone is not surprising. You know, we, we were, we spent a lot of time together, but I, I think that's that it just worked organically and, and, you know, and, 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 you know, I probably get a little credit as a band leader, you know, because that's what a band leader, I mean, that's the hard part of, of this gig, right? I mean, did we talk about this already? Yeah. That the other 22 hours. Yeah. Yeah. It's not, pop, it's not, it's not brain surgery, this pop music, but you want somebody who cares about the gig, who's going to get better and better and better at that little simple gig. You know, music's kind of like food. There's foie gras and then there's hamburgers. And if you just got if your song is a hamburger, you want a guy who's going to cook that hamburger like he's foie, like it's foie gras. He's going to treat it like it's his foie gras. You don't want some guy just dismissing it, and and you know it's all in the makeup of the characters. There's also something about serving consistently good hamburgers too. You know, yeah, no, it, it's it's about it's about quality. It's about you know being good, changing it up, making it fresh enough. You have to work at it. There's no question about it. Looking after yourself, definitely. And, and you know, that's kind of the sad part about my, my hearing loss is that this is going to sound silly, but it's true. We were still improving. We're still becoming a better band. No, I mean, I don't disagree. I mean, listening to any of those songs on weather, if you pulled out one of those songs and played it next to somebody who'd never heard you, Lewis, in the news and, and played it next to something from sports, you be would, would be hard pressed to figure out which was more recent. I, 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 I'm glad you said that. I'm very proud of our of, of, of weather of our album weather. I think it's really good. It, it should be. We uh, we wrote the song and then we played it on the road and then we rearranged it and then we re recorded it or then maybe even played it again. I mean, some of them like um, her love is killing me. We've been working on you know it's the simplest of songs and Chris had the riff. I wrote the rest of it. We put it together uh, and we jammed on it. It just, we couldn't get it. It just wasn't very good. And we, we tried to play it live. We had this other idea. We we're going to start it acoustically and then have the horn second come out and bust into it. And we did that. We tried to, we finally gave up on the song. 
just gave up on it. And then like 10 years, eight years later, we're in rehearsal and I guess Chris or somebody started playing the lick and, and we fell into it and played it and oh, it sounded great. And I think it's because we had the exact right tempo you mm. know, it, it, in a very simple song. And we became intimate with the song. We knew that we, you know, we know it really well. So that so it evolved. So we took our time as a point with, with all this stuff. And I feel like we're cheating people with only seven tunes. <laughs> I mean, and Kanye only had seven. I'm guessing that, um, you, you know, you speak about like the departed friends that you're singing about in, in, in one of the boys. And I, I'm guessing it, does that kind of relate back to what we were talking about at the beginning uh, with uh, the people that were in the jam sessions with your dad? Or is this more the contemporaries like Philip and um, Michael Jackson and stuff? Or is it all all of the above? Well, it's all of the above. Uh, I, you know, wrote it originally. I mean, I had to took a meeting with a guy called Dave Cobb. He's a great record producer in, in Nashville. Produces uh, Sturgill Simpson and I think Chris Stapleton. All the, he's, you know, and somebody we had lunch and he said, yeah, "I think I'm going to be producing Willie Nelson." And he said, "I wonder if you could write a song for Willie Nelson." I went, "Really? You really, you really think I should write a song for?" Wow! Thank you. I said, "Thank you." I'll try. I mean, I'll give it a thought. And I thought, I can't write a song for what I'm going to write for what else. And so, you know, a couple of weeks later, oddly enough, I just woke up with this thing in my head, the little melody and the, and the, and the words and the idea. And so I called him up and I said, Hey, I got an idea for you. You can write. He says, well, just demo it up and send it to me. I said, well, it's, you know, it's country. I mean, we don't, you know, he says, no, 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 don't do it. I said, okay. So I went to Johnny, my old Johnny, my, you know, and Johnny took it. And Johnny record, we recorded it on his computer on the road, each instrument one at a time. And then I sang it in his hotel room and there it is, you know, <laughs> it's amazing. But, uh, but I wrote it for, and then we sent it off to Willie and, uh, to Steve Cup and, and he didn't get the gig, so mm. uh, and then Bill Gibson said, "I think I think we should do it." I said, "Really, B Billy? It's country." He says, "Yeah, but you sing it okay, and it sounds good. You know, I think it's good." So, well, whatever. Let me. So I, I listened to it again, and I realized it's my life story, and 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 it was it was sent to me by Dave Cobb. Dave Cobb not only sent me off to write a Willie tune, he said. I see it this way. He said, I see, you know, Willie's one of the last guys around and all these guys are gone and, and, and bubble up and they're just in the sky or maybe or so. I think even, even it totally inspired the song. So I wrote it all down and then I went, Whoa, this, this hits home. <laughs> how, how often has that been your writing process where something comes to you and you're just in awe of it? Well, you know, when you write, sometimes you write and you write and write and then a line comes to you and it's good. It's like gold. It's like, it's like they're just giving it. It's like the muse just says, here you go. There, there, and there are some gray lines. What's so funny about peace, love and understanding? You know, um, hey, Mickey, what a pity you don't understand. You take me by the heart and you take me by the hand. You know, there's just some great stuff like that in pop music that's great. And Bonnie knows about all that. Oh, yeah. That's that's what Bonnie's about. I mean, and 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 it's the perfect marriage of the of that, you know, music and that, and the, the words are telling you, and the music's got to be telling you the same thing. They both got to be telling you the same. They're all telling you the same story, and that's how you get it. You get it when everybody's telling you the same story. Huey Lewis, I love that analysis of songwriting. Sometimes the muse just says. Here you go. But, of course, because there are times when the muse says, leave me alone, I'm helping somebody else out, there is always Berkeley Online. And because you listen to this podcast, you can get $100 off your first course. All you have to do, go to musicismylifepod.com right now and follow the instructions there. This episode was edited by Talia Smith, mastered by Jose David Vindis Mora, all visual assets coordinated by Mike DeBenedictus. Social media by Brooke Larson. Web assistance courtesy of Mark Thomas, Steve Zimmerman, and Joe McDonough. I wrote and recorded the Music Is My Life theme song, but the expert remixing comes courtesy of Lily Dickinson. Special thanks to Gabriel Reifert Cohen, Ashley Pointer, Deanne Fitzmaurice, Nina Bombardier, and thanks to you for listening. 
Take note to join us on Monday, April 5th for a special guest, Camila Marshall. Stay safe, listeners, and stay inspired. 